Okay, so we'll talk about vaginal cytology and estrus, and we'll be talking, we all be talking in particular about the canine estrus cycle, because feline estrus cycle, uh, for class purposes, is going to be covered as a group project. So if you want, have a look at this link. It's human, and I think it's about five or six minutes, but it's just a refresher, overall review of the estrous cycle in humans and how the follicles developed and the hormonal interactions. It's not a bad idea to watch it. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the various hormones and what they affect, where they come from. Um, so this kind of gives you a bigger, a greater overview if you'd like to have a look at that. Very brief overview of the estrous cycle and the hormones that are related to it. So the pituitary gland releases the follicle stimulating hormone, or FSH, to tell the ovary to start the follicle production. The ovary then releases the estrogen. Brain sends out the luteinizing hormone, which causes the follicle to burst or rupture, and it releases the egg. Progesterone is released by the ovary to help prepare the uterus for fetal development. Okay, so a couple little points to note is that both estrogen and progesterone are released by the ovaries, and the purpose of progesterone mainly is, and we'll see when it peaks in a particular area in the cycle, is to prepare the uterus for development of the fetus. So why would an RBT need to know about the estrus cycle in dogs? What's the purpose? Lots of different time, or lots of different reasons that could go with this. One, of course, if you're working with a, a clinic or a facility that does a lot of breeding with dogs, with cats, with horses, whatever it might be. If you're working with any or in any aspect that could be a breeding facility or, or breeding clients, you have to be very aware of the estrus cycle and the hormones that go hand in hand with each phase of the estrus cycle. Because in all reality, um, with the estrous cycle, there's only certain times within the cycle that a dog or a cat would be willing to breed. The female, of course, males, they'll always breed. But the females, only a certain time that they'll be willing to breed. And there's only a certain little tiny opportunity for the egg to become fertilized. So right around uh, ovulation is when the egg is released. And then a short period within that, that the egg can actually be fertilized by the sperm. So it's important to know for that reason. Other reason as well is a lot of, well not a lot, but some clinical illnesses such as a pyometra, so infection of the uterus, pus-filled uterus, tends to happen within a certain period of time of the cycle. I don't know if you can hear that moaning, but that, that's my dog <laughs> scratching her ears. <laughs> it's really weird. So um, with pyometras, they don't happen all the time in intact dogs. They certainly don't happen to every dog. But when they do, they tend to often happen within two months of a certain phase of the estrus cycle. So we need to typically know how long each of these phases will last for to help gauge whether or not a sick animal that comes in could have one of these illnesses. Again, for breeding purposes too. And then also a lot of times uh, before we do a spay on an intact, obviously an intact cat or dog, female, the vet often wants to know whether or not the animal's been in heat lately, is currently in heat, etc. So it's normally up to the RVT to check for clinical signs, talk to the owner uh, to see if the animal is in fact in heat now or uh, is in that the, the period of heat in general, so proesterous or estrus. So we often have to be aware of what the cycle is to be able to rebook the appointment for the patient a um, couple weeks down, pardon me, down the road. All right, so the stages that we're going to go through, they're just a continuous cycle, and one just sort of continues into the next stage, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as it relates to the change in the epithelial cells of the vaginal lining. So as these phases change, the hormones are going to change, they're, they're going to peak and then dip, and that relates to changes in attitude, uh, behavior and also in the actual cells and the cellular makeup of the vaginal canal. So some say that it starts off with proesterous. I mean, it's it's a cycle. It's continual. So we'll just decide to start off as proesterous. Proesterous is a nine-day cycle. Within this cycle, we start to see an increase in estrogen. The clinical signs would be the males might be showing interest in the female, but the female will not let the male mount. There might be vulvar edema, so some swelling of the vulva. Bloody discharge is common during this phase. 
the endometrium starts to develop thanks to that estrogen release. And then we shift into estrus. Estrus again is nine days. Luteinizing hormone has a peak, so it really surges within estrus. And then luteinizing, that's important to know because right after that luteinizing hormone peaks, two days later, is typical for ovulation. So 24 to 48 hours after the luteinizing hormone peak is when ovulation typically occurs. So then there is an estrogen decrease and the progesterone is starting to increase, keeping in mind that the progesterone is going to increase to help that uterus be prepared for the, the potential fetus. In estrus, and only in estrus, the female will accept a male, so she'll allow the male to melt. In this phase as well, you'll see decreased vulvar edema, discharge might be more clear or straw, straw color, and plus or minus exhibiting lordosis. Lordosis is much, much, much more common in cats, and um, I, I have a picture a little bit later I can show you, but it's where the animal is really excited to get uh, a bum scratch, so a nice scratch between their tail and their back. But essentially, they're presenting themselves to a potential mate. That's lordosis. Estrus, as well, when we get into cytology of each of these, uh, these phases, estrus is the one that is most um, uh, consistently the same cellularity-wise when we're looking at vaginal swabs compared to any other cycle. And then we have proester or sorry, diesterous, which lasts about 60 days, so two months in the dog. The progesterone continues to increase because again, this is when it's supplying or um, preparing the uterus for potential fetal development. The bitch will no longer accept the males. There's little discharge, might be clear, uh, little to no vulva edema, vulva edema. In this phase, um, it's very common to have pseudo, or it's not super common, but this is the phase that pseudopregnancy most often occurs. And pseudopregnancy is where the animal's not in fact pregnant, but the hormones are continuing to surge and their brains get confused and they actually start to think that they're pregnant. So you see it a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times in big dogs, and they'll start showing mammary gland development, they might have abdominal development, uh, get like a potty belly, and they'll start nesting and getting ready for the incoming litter. After this phase, or during, during and toward the end of this phase, is also when pyometras often occur. And pyometra, again, is infection of the uterus, and it only happens in dogs who have uterus and uh, dogs who have uterus and ovaries all together. Common clinical signs for a pyometra would be lethargy. That's probably your number one sign. So it happens to cats, happens to dogs. It can happen to all sorts of uh, mammalian species. So the dog or cat would come in, and a lot of times the owner's just saying they're not quite right. They're just not quite themselves. If it's a cat, sometimes cats hide because cats do that when they're sick. But otherwise, just lethargy, um, might still be wagging their tail, getting up for walks, but just not having the same amount of energy as they normally would. If it's uh, quite pronounced, you also will get vomiting because they feel really crummy inside. They have a uterus that's filled with pus. And then, of course, you can also see an increase in temperature as it continues and carries on because they're harboring a ton of uh, bacteria and inflammation in their uterus. So with that, I, I'm sure I've talked about it before, but you can have an open or closed pyometra. Open is when there's active discharge coming from the vulva. Um, in the open pyometras, it makes it a little bit more easy to see, to identify that it is pyometra right away, even though this isn't up to us. This is up to the vets, of course. But with us, our involvement as RVTs would be to take a swab of that discharge and confirm that, yes, in fact, there are lots of inflammatory cells lots of bacteria, and the white blood cells are looking like they've been fighting a battle for quite some time. So a lot of phagocytosis, possible degenerate um, neutrophils, degenerate macrophages, etc. And in open and closed, either way, um, oftentimes they go to surgery. Depending on some special cases, they might just get sent home with antibiotics, but it's a pretty special case if that's, if that's it. And then lastly, we have anesterous, and this is essentially... The period of inactivity. It lasts about four to five months. There's a sharp decrease in progesterone. No obvious clinical signs. Extremely 
little to no secretions at all. So it's pretty much a period of inactivity for the uterus and the, uh, the hormones and the tissues. Oh yeah, so I forgot to mention this. If the bitch is pregnant, um, she'll be pregnant during diestrus and she'll maintain pregnancy during diestrus. So this is just a slide to confirm that or reaffirm that. And it just has a really weird picture of this weird, strange little dog that I thought was kind of cute and weird. This is a good chart to get to know. It's uh, super, well, I don't know. To me, it looks a little bit basic, the drawing-wise, but it's quite good. It explains the hormone fluctuations quite well. So if we look at our various hormones, we've got estrogen is the red line here. And then we've got the dotted yellow line is progesterone. And luteinizing hormone is this sort of bluish purple line. So looking at our chart here, in proesters we have an increase in estrogen. We had an increase in estrogen. And then it starts to decrease as it gets toward estrus. In the estrus cycle, uh, we're starting to see prog progesterone climb quite steadily. And again, just about a day, 24 hours after estrus starts, we've got that luteinizing hormone peak in the estrus phase. And two days after that, 24 to 48 hours after that, we typically have ovulation. That's most common for most dogs. However, they can fluctuate, they can ovulate 72 hours after, they can ovulate 16 hours after the start of the LH peak. So every animal is a little bit different. These are our general guidelines. And this was the picture of the cat in lordosis. So if you were to scratch said cat around there, nice little bum pat, they get very, very excited and stomp their cute little feet. And a cat in heat is uh, its often quite scary for the clients. So it's not uncommon for you to get uh, phone calls at your clinic saying, I've got an eight-month-old female cat. She's running around the house screaming. I don't know what's wrong with her. She really loves getting pet. She really, really, really loves getting pet. But man, she's just screaming and crazy. I better bring her in. And sometimes these conversations, you know, if it sounds like it's more than heat, then yeah, definitely bring the cat in. But a lot, a lot of the time it's just to talk about heat and then talk about spaying your kitty and the numerous, numerous benefits about spaying your kitty. This is just a very brief point. Um, we're not going to get into the breeding cycles of most animals. We're mostly going to stick to dogs. And then I believe equine and feline are going to be covered in group project material. So there are long and short day breeders. And that meaning long is when the daylight is quite long, short when the daylight is quite short. So short day breeders, we're talking about those who breed in the fall and winter. And long day breeders are spring and summer. Then there's the equine estrus cycle as well, which we won't go into too much detail about. So they're again sensitive to the light in regard to breeding and cycling. They're uh, seasonally polyesterous. The estrus phase lasts five to seven days. Estrogen increases. The mare is actually receptive to the stallion. Again, outside this period, it's unlikely that she would allow the stallion to mount. Ovulation happens again about the, oh, sorry, with horses, ovulation occurs the last 24, 48 hours of estrus. Diestrus is four to 14 to 15 days. Progesterone's increasing, and the mare will not accept the stallion because she's saying, nope, thanks, I've been bred, I'm pregnant, I'm happy, don't touch me. That's what I picture them saying. Sample collection. So moving on, RVT, this is our role in clinic. We often have to take vaginal swabs to check for things like vaginitis, to check for um, inflammation and pyometra, and also to check for cellular changes that would be indicative of the bitch being in heat prior to a spay. So in this case for dog, gather the equipment, open the labia. Um, if, if there's any discharge or just in general, if the labia is quite swollen, if there's a lot of vulvar swelling, I would just wipe the area with sterile saline and a gauze gently just to avoid a lot of contamination, mainly to avoid any contamination going from the outside world in to the vaginal canal, but also to avoid contamination of your sample itself. So you'll moisten the swab with sterile saline, and the purpose of that is mainly to prevent the breakup of cells when you apply them onto your slide because the cotton tip swabs, cotton tip applicators, that cotton is really... Um, scratchy and it's really quite detrimental to the cells themselves. It destroys them really easily. Ear swabs, when we're doing those, 
It's a lot easier. There's wax protecting the cells. They tend not to break and uh, be destroyed quite as easily as it would be with a plain old soft tissue sample. So always moisten the swab. Second to that, uh, it's to increase comfort in these animals. Now, when animals, when you have to do a vaginal swab, most of them do not enjoy it. Cats probably will enjoy it if they're in heat because cats are induced ovulators. So you can actually induce ovulation in the cat by doing a vaginal swab. So you have to be careful of that if it is a breeding cat for whatever reason that might be. Uh, because when you do your swab, they'll go ahead and start ovulating, <laughs> which is kind of neat. And they'll really enjoy it, apparently. Uh, dogs, however, and animals in general, the, the time that they don't, that they're, they're most not receptive, I suppose, but they, they don't seem to mind the swab as much when it's done during the actual estrus phase. And that's because their vaginal lining has thickened up quite a bit, lots of skin cells, to allow for copulation. So it's increased in thickness to allow for the trauma of copulation. Other than that, the vaginal lining, the vaginal epithelium is quite thin. So you can be quite, it, it can be quite traumatic to swab the vaginal lining. Um, it can be quite painful for these animals, so always be cautious, be careful, be gentle. So you'll moisten the swab, collect your sample, and just note where the swab is going into. Okay, so into the vaginal canal. Try not to just take a sample of the labia, because that doesn't really help the situation or of the, the vulva. We want to actually get into the vaginal canal um, to acquire a decent, a decent sample. And then you'll prepare the slide in the three steps, uh, or in the, as a roll, just roll your sample onto the slide, and then stain it according to normal cytology protocols. So we'll switch gears a little bit. We've got the Leaning Tower of Pisa here, and that is a good reminder of how to remember the cells that you'll probably see the uh, vaginal epithelial cells on your swab sample. So P stands for parabasal, I is intermediate, S superficial, a, a nuclear, and you've probably seen the base words of these before, especially basal cell being the baby cell of the epithelium, so the very young cell of the epithelium. Intermediate cells are the sort of middle stage. They're starting to lose their adhesion to each other. They're starting to float up more superficially, starting to have some changes that are indicating cell aging. Superficials, we start to think, look a little bit more uh, sorry, reflect back, think more toward what um, squamous cells look like in urine. So they have lots and lots of cytoplasm and a tiny little pycnotic nucleus. And then we have a nuclear, which are pretty self-explanatory. They are without a nucleus. Looking at your vaginal slides, uh, this is what you're going to be looking at. The elusive parabasal, I say that because I have tried so many times to get a good sample with a ton of of parabasal cells with a high population of parabasal cells. I seem to only get them on cat vaginal cytology in abundance. I cannot seem to capture parabasal cells in abundance on dog vaginal cytology. So if you ever get a whole bunch of parabasals on a slide, please send them to me at Seneca College <laughs> and I will love you forever because I, I would love to be able to show the class lots of these. So these cells are the babies. They're the very basement layer of the epithelium. Uh, of the epidermis, sorry. So they are the original little young cells. They've got a happy round purple nucleus, very low amount of cytoplasm compared to the size of their nucleus, and fairly uniform in shape, fairly round, uh, healthiest, youngest cells. They're dominant in anestrus, although I haven't seen that. Then we have intermediate cells, so they still have that healthy round nucleus, so the nucleus is about the same size as the parabasal cell. I say a nuclei is smaller in my notes, I'm just realizing that now. But realistically, they're pretty much the same size. They might be ever so slightly smaller than a parabasal, but they're really quite comparable to a parabasal cell nucleus. And they're, they've still got that nice round, I call it happy, but happy healthy shape to the, the nucleus. Dominant, you'll see them dominant or predominantly in anestrus, proestrus, and estrus. And you have small intermediate cells and then large intermediate cells. 
Small ones look fairly similar to a pear basil, except they have a little bit more cytoplasm, and the large ones have a lot more cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm, the edges of the cytoplasm are really starting to change. They're starting to take on that um, corn flaky sort of folded appearance, but they still have round, healthy nuclei. So this is a great picture, fairly common uh, vaginal cytology to see. We've got various cells here all throughout. They all have, see it's, I mean, they're, they're comparable in size, definitely the, the nuclei, but they all have nice round purple nuclei. And just flipping to the next one, you can see we've got small intermediates here. And then we have a pear basil, which has very little cytoplasm, so increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, and the large intermediate, which has increased cytoplasmic to nuclear ratio. And then we have a smudge cell. Nothing exciting with this much cell. Moving on, getting a little bit older, so sort of middle age, getting into their senior years, epithelial cells of the vaginal epithelium. We have large, oh, no, I lied. We have superficial cells, and they are the largest epithelial cells, those and a nuclear. And pretty much you can say exactly the same thing about superficial cells as you can about nuclear cells. The only difference, of course, is that the anuclear cells, which I'll go to next, have spat out or disintegrated their nucleus. So they no longer have a nucleus, they're dead cells. Superficial cells are dying, but they're not quite dead yet. So they have this tiny little pycnotic nucleus, lots of cytoplasm, really thin cytoplasm, tends to get that corn flaky appearance sort of folded over, and they're the very most abundant during estrus. Estrus, the one phase of estrus, lasts nine days. That is the one stage that you pretty much can, well, you can't guarantee, but it's super, super reliable to look at a slide and say, yes, she is an estrus, looking at the cytology alone. Never 100%, but estrus is the only phase that has 90% or more superficial cells and anuclear cells. It doesn't, it, it might have some... Uh, large intermediates, and then maybe some pair, uh, pair basal starting up again. And that's because as the hormones are changing throughout each of these cycles, it's a turnover. So you're getting cellular turnover in the vaginal epithelium at each stage. So you might get a couple of the cells from, you know, large intermediate that are common in proestrus, small intermediates, etc. But in estrus cycle or in estrus phase, most common is to have 90% or more superficial and anuclear cells. Okay, and this is anuclear. There we go, anuclear, no nucleus. Then we get into white blood cells. So you can see white blood cells in estrus or in the estrus cycle. It's not uncommon. This one actually, in fact, has a eosinophil. The way, I mean, you have to look at your neutrophils and think whether or not this is a pyometra or vaginitis, that kind of thing. You can also get bacteria in vaginal epithelial cell swabs or vaginal epithelial swabs in general. So again, looking at bacteria, looking at the neutrophils, have a look at your sample as a whole. Are you seeing an overall generalized inflammatory reaction? So are you also seeing macrophages on the scene? Are the neutrophils phagocytizing bacteria? Are you seeing degenerate neutrophils? So you, yes, they can live happily normally, that's fine. But you really have to look at the sample and say, okay, are these just plain old neutrophils who are coming to clean up some of the mess? Or are they neutrophils that are coming out because there's infection, because of an, infl an inflammatory response that the body's creating, uh, etc.? So you have to look at the quality of the neutrophils and what they're doing. Red blood cells, most common in proestrus. That's when the bloody discharge happens. And then essentially, technically, they can be in every stage of the cycle, some less common than others, but they can carry over. And you might see them, of course, in estrus and then into diestrus, especially if the bitch has copulated um, throughout the estrus cycle. Bacteria, totally common to see. I think we have a few slides in class that have Simoncella bacteria as well, but these are just typical cocci on this one here, and they often cluster around those superficial or intermediate cells. Just like in ears, we talked about this with ears, with the keratinocytes, really common for bacteria to hitch a ride 
I always picture it like penguins on an iceberg just hanging out on that cell, um, hitching a ride around. And then just some interesting cells you might come into contact with when you're looking at vaginal epithelium. Medestra cells, also called medestrum cells, they're most common to see in diestrus. And if you can remember it, in humans, we tend to call diestrus medestrus, and it's the phase right after estrus. So hence where they get their name from, the human side of things. They're large intermediate cells with one or more neutrophils just passing through. They are not phagocytizing them. Okay, and we know that because these are not cells that would phagocytize neutrophils. Macrophages, yeah, totally, they would phagocytize neutrophils, but uh, vaginal epithelium, it's a pretty rare case that they might, but realistically, it's very specialized cells that phagocytize, none of which we're talking about. So the process of the smaller cell passing through a larger cell is called empiriopolysis. And here are some examples. So just looking up here, we've got Beautiful large intermediate cells with, look at that, four neutrophils just hanging out. And eventually they can be spat out. Just hanging out. Happy little neutrophils. Okay, we have foam cells. And these are little parabasal or small intermediate cells that have vacuoles. Nothing extremely cl clinical about these to be concerned about. Uh, most often seen in diestrus and anestrus. Rarely seen in proestrus. Now this last part I'll talk about, but you need to know that you cannot stage which phase or where specifically in the estrus cycle the bitch is in based solely on cytology. You cannot. You can see commonalities, so it's common to see these types of cells in this phase, but you cannot guarantee that she's in diestrus because of these blah 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 cells that you saw. So the way to truly test and identify which stage she's in, clinical signs are really important, and that is physical exam findings, but also behavior as noted by the owner, and hormonal testing. Okay, so checking the estrogen levels, progesterone, luteinizing hormone, checking those levels to see where the bitch is at. Where, uh, yeah, proestrus. So common to see parabasals, apparently, Intermediate cells, superficials, and neutrophils in early proestrus. You can also see lots of RBCs because they have that bloody discharge. Estrus, this is the one that is most um, accurate to look at a slide and say, yeah, I really think she's an estrus based on her slide because no other stage really looks like estrus. If you take a little snapshot in your head about proestrus, look at here, we've got small intermediates, Large intermediates, you've got, oh, look, a superficial hanging out. So have a look at that, take a snapshot, and then when we get to other phases, like diestrus, they look exactly the same. Estrus, nothing looks like estrus. So 90% are more superficial and a nuclear cell, so it can be a mix of the two. Typically no neutrophils, and neutrophils often come in after estrus, but you might see them, okay? Not totally unheard of. Plus or minus RBCs, plus or minus bacteria, Diestrus, look, again, we've got large intermediate cells. We have uh, more or less a parabasal, kind of a small superficial, or uh, small intermediate, large intermediates. Okay, so it looks a lot like proestrus. And, sorry, not all of your diestrus samples are going to have all these metestrus cells. Just be aware of that. This is, you see them sometimes. Anestrus is a phase of inactivity, and most often you see parabasals and intermediates. So all of that being said, the importance is you need to know clinical signs, hormonal fluctuations, and then compare it to typical findings on vaginal cytology in each of those phases of the estrus cycle.